The studio was built by me and a woman builder, just the two of us. It took about nine months. Not the fastest way in the world to build, just with manual, you know, hammering in every nail. No, no guns, no, no nail guns. Uh, certainly we had a, but the entire uh, studio was built with just a radial saw. We had only the, the most ordinary tools. And um, I had been sort of casting about for the right name. Although I say the studio, I also, she needed a name. And uh, I thought, oh, that's it. Because if the studio is named her eye, that means that I will be working inside her eye and she will be watching over me. So that's why I chose that. Is that and I like the sound. I like the ma. I like those ah sounds. Come on in. Come on. There are you know, various, and you can pull that little chair up and some chairs over there. And um, it was uh, dedicated in 1987, I think, or 88. It's, um, it's about 10 or 12 years old now. And it's recently um, had a facelift. I've um, recently painted the whole, the whole place and knocked down some cobwebs that have been there for years. And the most recent addition, my spirits used to be clustered uh, in the four directions, but uh, some months ago, recently, within the last six months, Robert Lentz uh, carved all of many of these kachinas for me, and um, so many, and he just arrived one evening. Um, uh, and instead of uh, listen, would you some some friends want to see you uh, briefly? Would you would you would you come out and say hello to them? I said, oh Robert, I hope you didn't invite them to him because he was coming for a meal. No, 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 no. They just want to see you for a minute. And I thought this is very strange. I mean, Robert is as antisocial in many ways as I am. The idea of him moving around with a bunch of friends was anyway. I didn't cotton on to it. Anyway, when I got out uh, to the area here, he had, where the whole front of his, uh, the hood of his truck was covered with a blanket, and all of these were on the blanket. So um, some of some of the kachinas I had, but but these these new his gifts. This is a mountain lion. And he is the Lord of the North. This is uh, my mountain lion fetish right here. The, the altars are broken up now because m most of the photographs are off at the publishers. So usually there are photographs all along here. But so everything's a little higgly-piggly right now. This is um, the great <coughs> white bear of the North. So these are the northern, uh, these are the northern spirits. Um, some of the um, kachinas don't have, don't, aren't associated with specific directions. Um, in, the, in the Hopi and uh, among the Hopi and Zuni people, some are specifically directional animals. Others are, are hunting fetishes um, and, and, and kachinas. This is, of course, the great um, uh, ram. And the uh, two-prong antelope, which is, um, sorry, this is the two-prong antelope. This is, of course, the stag. And um, this is um, a kachina unique to Zuni. And she is called the keeper of the animals. So in many ways, she shares some of the Artemisian energy uh, associated with animals. Uh, this is the great fierce grandmother, um, Kachina, uh, kind of the equivalent of Kali. She's, um, she has a, a lot of heavy duty, um, you know, dark in her. She, she has a long uh, black beard, an ancient grandmother with beard. This is my beloved crow mother. You saw a slide of her. And here's the corn in her, in her basket. The, did he make that one? No, this one I've had for a long time. This was, he actually, this is a gift to him from many years ago. For, I th well, I say many years ago. It was for one of my birthdays. I can't remember. Um, this is um, my powerful uh, wolf kachina. He did make this one. Mm. And this is my fierce badger kachina, who was, who was in that painting of uh, uh, becoming badger. Um, this kachina is... Um, 
a very mysterious. He's kind of like a kachina, but he's more than a kachina. Like Chroma, there's more than a kachina. And he wears this horse tail um, down um, in, in, in front of his face. And he is the sort of, he is like the husband to her. This is what uh, the oldest kachinas look like. Um, they, they only gradually evolve. They began uh, looking like this or like this, and only gradually do they become kind of full-fledged, so to speak, dolls uh, with the human. Now she is, um, she's kind of like a Gaia. She is the, the oldest, the darkest, the most remote uh, female goddess, woman, you know, holy woman spirit uh, among the Zuni people. And the earliest, as I say, earliest Kachinas were simply, um, uh, well, obviously they're all from trees, they're all carved from cottonwood trees. But in the beginning, they were, they were much, much simpler than they are now. And um, this one is actually carved, designed and carved based on a photograph that uh, Robert found in a really old, from the 1820s, I think, some old magazine he found in some archive. And he saw this in this very old photograph taken inside a Pueblo, uh, sorry, inside a, a Kiva, I mean. He saw this lying sort of sideways like this. And um, I don't know if he talked to somebody or figured out himself that this is who this was. Until then, he had only known it in terms of someone having, uh, he I had either read about it or someone had told him about her. I, I don't tell you the names because uh, I, I can't say them right. I kind of know the sound of her name, um, but I'm, I'm not a linguist and I don't say them. I don't even try to say them out loud because I don't want to say them incorrectly. Anyway, this is her husband. These are like the most remote in the dimmest places of tribal memory, the, the great mother, the great father. And the, the sacred marriage is between them. And this is our uh, beautiful antelope unique to New Mexico, the, the two-prong antelope. The deserts of New Mexico are filled with these dear little animals. So these are my spirits. This is Crow Mother's Claw, which I will be blessing you with tomorrow. This originally was a little apple tree that someone gave me, and uh, it died. And I couldn't bear to just sort of toss it away, so it, l it lay around and lay around. And years later, when all the bark had fallen off and it had really become something other than it had been, it had split and so on, um, I was sitting on the porch, you know, one day, and I looked out, and although it had been lying there for a long, long time, I suddenly realized, that's her claw. And I went out and it was a much longer, you know, it was like down to here. As I say, it was the, the branch. This wasn't here. This, this was the original little tree. So I made it into her claw and then I added this, uh, the, 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 fourth, the fourth claw, so to speak. And um, this has become a very powerful, um, I use it to, um, I use it this way on the ground or because obviously birds are down here and of course birds are up there. So in fact, we can take this back with us so we have it with us tomorrow. And I, I have, um, I have um, quite a number of, uh, of uh, animals, um, animal skins. This is a small female coyote. I keep her here like a nest because um, when I find birds that are in trouble, I bring them in and put them right here. And it's amazing how they revive. Mm -hmm. I just put them here and leave them alone. Mm -hmm. uh, they literally sort of perk up and want to fly out. This is a great, um, this is a great spirit in here. This is a, a beautiful, beautiful coyote. This is a big male coyote. And it's made so it can be worn ritually. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? Robert made this for me for my 50th birthday. Oh my gosh. So if you'd like to, uh, I'll, pass, I'll pass, pass him around. So he's male, she's female. 
So these are my dog dog in the studio. If you'd like to put it on, it just it just fits fits on your head like a hat. And this is mountain lion. And this is an, an unusual mountain lion pelt because the feet are still intact. Usually the first thing they chop off are the feet because the, the, uh, the uh, energy is, is for animals. Of course, the feet are, the, are hugely important. So the fact that this one still has its, its claw, paws and claws is pretty beautiful. And a beautiful tail. So this is my mountain lion. I don't know if you want to, if you want to handle them all, you know, okay. And then what, how did you come by this one? Uh, Robert gave it to me. <laughs> yes, the source of many, many mysteries. Uh, it's important, um, the thing about sacred, sacred objects is they really should be given. Either you, you find them or they should be given to you. And even if you find something, and I, and I do believe this, you find something, someone else should actually make the cash transaction so that it comes to you in a roundabout way rather than as a commercial. Uh, and the same with, uh, well, with any, it, it, I, th I think you, you would appreciate that. This is a, a very powerful piece in my life. Um, this is a horse tail. And this is, I think, if I just pass this around and you just grasp it like this and, and hold it uh, with your energy, you'll, you'll feel the power in this piece. And the other pieces, uh, starting at the East Altar, this is where I, I start my prayers in the morning at the East Altar. Uh, there's the painting you saw this morning of wolf milk. It's the original. And um, the other things on that altar are, this is my masculine energy altar. And this is where wolf uh, lives. Wolf is with me now because I'm teaching. Wolf is the teacher. Uh, so when I'm teaching, I have wolf, wolf with me, unless I'm traveling. If I'm traveling, I always travel with him. Otherwise, he lives on the East Altar. Uh, this is Meinrad, my uncle Meinrad. And this is where he's buried, right here. And this is the chapel um, of the Black Madonna of Einsiedlen that I told you about, so he's buried over in this area. This is the original mine red skull, all decorated with, um, with gold and pearls and precious jewels. This is a, an old, old postcard of Einsiedlen. This is uh, mine red, the original mine red welcoming uh, pilgrims to his uh, hut. And this is a scene from his martyrdom, Thomas Merton. This is Gustav Mahler, my favorite composer. And um, uh, Joseph Campbell. This is uh, uh, Saint James Santiago, whom I shall uh, shall be visiting very soon. This is wonderful. This uh, this power man. Uh, what do you? <laughs> what was it? Power the, ranger. Pa pa power ranger. Um, I, I, when when I was completely healed, my friends gave me a party. Um, and this was sitting on top of the cake. <laughs> <laughs> Mine had risen from the dead. So he's a pretty, he's a pretty powerful fellow. <laughs> and the south altar is, um, this is a, a, one of the charcoal paintings from 1965 when I lived on the mountain in Montserrat. This is Our Lady of Montserrat that I went to every day. And this is my bell tower. This is the little monastery. Now this is the monastery for nuns, not the monastery for men. And I was on that, the, middle, the middle rung of uh, windows in that bell tower. Mm -hmm. And from this height, because you can't see it because we're actually up in the mountain, but from the top of this mountain, you, you know, it was just this surrounded by valleys with the, with the river below. You can walk around and see these later. And uh, the direction for this, uh, for this energy, the south energy, is uh, coyote. This is a very old coyote fetish. 
you see how in, uh, in the beginning uh, uh, fetishes in the beginning weren't carved they were found they were river stones that were found and you know became whatever animal they were meant to become and so the old fetishes still remain that kind of basically stone look it's only much later now when you go to buy a fetish they're really no longer fetishes they're really little little sta little um, stone carvings uh, realistic stone carvings of animals um, and the west that altar is dedicated to Lakshmi she's the Indian a goddess, South Indian especially, goddess. Um, she's the goddess who always takes care of you. She's the one who makes sure that there's bread in the cupboard and, uh, you know, milk milk and your fruit. And she takes care of your needs and uh, makes sure that you always have um, a place to stay. And Consort of Vishnu. 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 Okay. And that's that river rug that you see often in my paintings. When I hang it vert vertically like that, it represents for me rain. And when I hang it horizontally, it represents the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. And that's the West Altar. It's um, my altar dedicated to horse energy. Remember that the horse and the dog are both chthonic uh, animals associated with, uh, with death and the underworld. So she is, um, so they, there's some horse, uh, various horse energies there. Uh, horse uh, images. That little print is a, a little serigraph by a friend of mine. And um, and this is the above altar hanging right here. And in there is uh, eagle. And in fact, I'm going to walk under Amy. I forgot to call your attention to this uh, to this kachina, this great eagle kachina. And I'll turn it around so you can see the sacred lake, the heavenly lake on his back. This is where Ego collects all the waters of creation and holds them until he can spill them. Isn't it beautiful, the idea of the eagle flying around with a lake on, a lake on its back? And it's nice because when the cooler's on in the summer, um, he moves around. <laughs> it's really quite, quite beautiful. But you see how... Um, with what detail they're made, if you'd like to handle them. They're, they're exquisitely, I mean, all the little pieces of jewelry. and uh, I'll get you the, the big buffalo. Did I, maybe I even, did I even tell you this is buffalo? Buffalo is gorgeous. Isn't he fabulous? And, um, this is a very important pot in my life. Um, Manuel's mother, whose name is Pauline, is a corandera. She's nearly totally blind now, and she, ha you know, she's never had any English, so I really can only barely communicate her, mostly with sign languages and hugs. Anyway, um, she uh, has been to the studio from time to time, and when she first came here, she immediately saw this badger pot. This is um, Casas Grande uh, a pot from Casas Grande, uh, Mexico, uh, about uh, four, hour, four hours south of Nogales, if you know if you know where that is in Mexico. And um, she um, got very excited and started blah, 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 blah. and I had to. And I think I think Robert was here too. Robert said. Oh, she says uh, it's uh, she wants she wants to know why the badger pot is empty. And I said, Well, what do you mean? And and he translated. And then what she started saying was, Well, you must feed badger every day. You must feed badger food and corn and beans and blah blah blah, 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 blah lots of food and lots of money. Badger, you know, badger needs lots and lots of money. And she went on and on and on about. Um, and then uh, she produced from her magic pouch, like some wonderful old Corindera. Uh, she produced a magnet, and from her, again from this purse, she rattled around and started pulling out nickels and dimes and quarters and so on, which of course immediately attached to the magnet. And she said, 
if you if you have your keep your pot keep badger pot filled with uh, lots of food so there are beans and corn there's beans and corn and uh, rice in here and uh, throw money to him from time to time you will always have money money will always come to you you see these see this is the primitive magnet mm. you see these every, every little every little piece you want to so this is my this is my magic pot so I feed I feed badger every day. Pass it round. Oh, thank you, thank you. No, I don't mean every day. I remember, but I certainly remember often enough to know that it's an important. Uh... So get yourself a badger pot, and get yourself a magnet, and uh, your money problems will be over. <laughs> <laughs> Never have Financial to think about advice, it. Right? Financial yeah. advice. Well, yes, uh, you can uh, because the whole Casas Grande tradition, which was resurrected. It's originally from the 1200s, 12 and 1300s, and it fell into complete, um, passed out of uh, memory, of tribal memory. But it was resurrected in the 1950s, and um, it's now, um, uh, when I went down there about 10 years ago, it was only, it was only the, the, the pots were only beginning to be available, so if you wanted one, you really had to go down and get them. But now, in fact, you can buy them. Uh, without any difficulty at all, in um, but it's the the these are called effigy pots. The effigy pots are hard to get hold of because the people tend to make them only for themselves for their own use. So in that sense, there. But this is another beautiful Casas Grande. This is uh, uh, an effigy pot. This is a beautiful f a female effigy pot. Isn't she beautiful? Mm. I don't know. She she's self-contained. <laughs> she doesn't. She doesn't. Characteristics of badger that would attract. Um. Well, I think. You mean why would it be badger who you feed in order to? Um, Pauline never, you know, never told me. Uh, but because badger is one of my spirit animals, I was thrilled to have this information. I'd never had this information. And I think it's because he's a digger. And he, um, it's like what he needs, he digs for. And I think that's a very beautiful spiritual concept. The, our, our, we, we dig for our in other words we work for our needs and in working for our needs we dig up literally what we need and in Badger's case of course he's digging up grubs and all sorts of things to eat I mean you, because this is what of course when you start raking up the ground all the critters do this and of course he just goes chump 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 this is why um, in Native American, at least Native Americans in this area, the folklore is that Badger will not tolerate having anyone with him but Coyote. And Coyote, who's the, the, the grandest of all opportunists, uh, hangs around Badger because as Badger digs, of course all these critters come flying out and Coyote just goes chomp, 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 chomp mm -hmm. as an opportunist. Um, but they, um, they probably, uh, um, Badger undoubtedly tolerates having Coyote around if, in, if, for his own, his or her own um, kind of safety as being a, a smaller animal. So many of the stories uh, in uh, both Hopi and among the um, Pueblo people, there are many stories about how Coyote and Badger travel together, they're buddies. It's it's obviously a, um, a self-fulfilling you know relationship, and it's easy to understand why, um, because certainly um, both of them would be out for, out for small uh, field mice, for instance. I'm sure that that's a kind of basic part of their diet for both of them, 
And as they come flying out, Badger couldn't get all of them at once. So it, it, I, I think of it in terms of baseball that, you know, the coyote, you know, feels, feels the area in back of Badger <laughs> and catches what he needs. I'd like to ask you, you said yes. you, you no longer, uh, since you had your shoulder surgery. Oh, yes. I wanted to show you uh, one of these, what the watercolors look like. Here are... Um, this is that first, now I showed you a slide of this, but this is what the, the, this is what the first watercolor looked like. And this is when I was painting, what is this critter here? I don't know what that is. Um, this is when I, when I was painting, uh, this is when I, I was attached to, the machine was here, I was attached to, you know, tubes in my nose. And I was still, I had no use of this arm at all. And I was painting like this. So I was kind of crouched over, and the paint was right here, and the brush, you know, the brushes, you know what I mean. I was yeah. guiding my arm around. So these early ones um, have that energy. Uh, this is a later one, last year maybe. Let's see. Yeah, this is last. This is the uh, the one I showed you. Techniques that you use in uh, like mother songs. Mm -hmm. is that the mother songs. This it's the same technique, only instead of using just black ink, I use colored inks like that one. Oh. And uh, so this you have to. This is uh, a board, I mean, it's, I say a board, it's, it's a really thick piece of cardboard, covered with plaster, and when you, when you buy it, uh, it's black. And the first thing I do is scratch all the, in a, in a very, you know, this kind of way, I scratch all the ink off, but then I paint back into it with ink, so that I get these fabulous textures. That's and, do you, well. and this is all sandpaper and steel wool. Well, that's how you take it off. Yeah, and also a small cutting tool. I'll show you. Wow, this is what I wanted to figure. Now, what was this the board? The is this the scratch yeah. board? No. Is it What's scratch it? board? It's called scratch board. You can buy it at any art store. And it's black. It's black. Mm -hmm. it's and it's black. actually a board. It, you can get it in white. Get it black. You can get it white, but I prefer the the, the black is much more interesting. Okay, oh, yeah. so here are the tools. It couldn't be simpler. When you buy it, this is what, it, oh. it, you buy it, it, it's all black. The first thing I did, you can see that this is okay. sanded down, like this. And I sand in a circular motion, and that circular motion is what destroyed my shoulder, because oh. I did this for 20 years. Yes, and big ones too. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Um, so then... Um, but then you keep, so you can, you put on the ink, you, t you scrape it out, you move it around, you put more ink on, you ta 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 And because it's a strong piece of uh, uh, thing okay. to work on, you've got lots of... Yeah, uh, well, this actually, when you buy it, it's thinner than this. I, I just back it with a piece of cardboard, just so it's easier to handle. But this is the only tool you need. This well, is a 15 good. cent tool. That and a lot of can I see this? Oh yes, of course. Of course. This is a scratch board. Well, you have you have to be inquisitive. Let me put it that way. You have to see. I wonder what would happen if I did this or if I did that. Um, and then you just scratch off. Yes. Yes. And so the actual design winds up is as a result of what's left on, rather than like you didn't or do you draw ink on also? Oh yeah, you're putting it on, taking it off, rubbing it out, scratching it here, and using different colors. And using different colors, um, yes. And it's, that's not the, is that the same technique? This is exactly the same, same technique, technique, except I'm using color, in that case, washes. That, that isn't really, some of them are really uh, densely, like brilliant reds. But that is a very, you know, that's not a brilliant uh, painting. I mean, it's, it's just the way, you can do anything with it. You can have brilliant colors, or you can have very, very subtle colors it's like this. Ink. It's all ink. Just because it's simple doesn't mean there's, yeah. it's anything less yeah. than, or it, it's still a but valuable. But you get so much texture, and I always wondered how you got so much texture. In well, now you work. know. This That's is what it. the texture is. Yes. This is a double O three steel wool and really very very uh, refined sandpaper. Mm -hmm. All of this you can't, you wouldn't, sp you won't spend ten dollars. Right. You know, I mean, so it's 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 you're not spending money. I mean, much of my artistic this life has been about I'm how to oh, make something without spending money because I've never had any money. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, really. You know, my <laughs> I should have started using my badger pot when I was eighteen, but I, I didn't know about my badger pot when I was eighteen. <laughs> Ooh. 
and all these eggs are dropping down like this. And the lower they get until finally there are these huge dark black eggs. I wanted to get these out for you just because, just because I do, from time to time, I stop a color. It's, I have to get underneath the color. And I go back to charcoal, which is really my, my primary, my first and one of my deepest loves. There'll be, you'll see a lot of uh, uh, charcoals in, in the book. And in fact, it's, what's interesting is when they first talked about this book, they made it clear from the beginning that they wanted half the book to be my black and white work. And I said, folks, you know, you're crazy because most people, when they see black and white, think that it's a black and white photograph of something colored and they feel cheated. In an art book, they want, they want if you're going to buy an art book, we want color. Uh, and I can remember Tom saying, nonsense. Uh, this is some of your most powerful work. And it's got to be at least half of the book. Well, I was astonished. Most publishers would have said just the opposite. We go, we'll go for the color, but you know, not too many of these because no, 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 no. So uh, there will be dozens of those big, strong graphics that I did in Florence. Most of that work is all done in Florence. And then the large charcoals that I did uh, at Montserrat, that's one of them on the, on the, on the south altar there. This is, this is one of the series uh, that I did at Montserrat. That is Prophet. That's one of the Prophet series. And that is like me down in the earth, uh, like dismembered broken to pieces with just my neck and my head sticking out and all that energy from above is you know flowing into my 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 head is is has just is just reduced to the essential open mouth so i'm receiving all that energy coming out of darkness at me and yet i'm i'm sort of up to my neck in uh, uh buried in the earth and the ones that I did at Stanbrook, most of them were done after uh, my mother died, and many of them are about my mother's death, including an entire series called The Mother's Birds, which were um, a series of very small charcoals uh, in relationship to the poetry that I, that I wrote. Songs. Uh, sorry, the mother's birds, and it's dedicated. Was done. These are all the little drawings I did immediately after she died, and when she died, I asked the abbess if I could could do like a 50-day private retreat inside, you know, inside the monastery, but just spending less time with the community. And I did these, and these are some of the original drawings. And this is my mother. And uh, this, this is from scripture. I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he called out to all the birds flying high in the sky, come and gather together for God's great feast. So the whole book is dedicated to my dear mother. Mm -hmm. And let's I'll just go through. And as I say, the originals have the poem written right below mm -hmm. the original. This, of course, is, is a... Mm -hmm. But in fact, Katie, my editor, is going to put the this this entire book will be in the book. Oh, oh. right! Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow! Wow! This is going to be quite a treasure. Yeah, oh. it's going to be a huge one. Wow! Well, I tell you, it's a miracle. I I told you that they appeared. They walked over that threshold of the twenty fifth anniversary of my mother's death. I mean, I ask you. Oh so. my! Goodness. Don't ever think your mothers are never with you. Oh, oh wow! wow. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. What's your prices? Oh, the, the prices are different from some of the prices. Uh, some of them are hundreds of dollars. Some of them are multiple thousands of dollars. The pieces I'm showing you I have aren't for sale, uh, at least right now. I never say nothing is for sale forever because I never know. Um, someone asked me, in fact, I think it was you, Belinda, if the Litany of the Great River, I mean the uh, Sound of the Rio Grande. And this is where she was, right here. Mm -hmm. She was here for years. I mean, I've painted her, I finished her, she hung there. 
In fact, I built this little, uh, this little altar to that painting, and it was all in relationship to um, as a Thanksgiving offering for the, sign, the publication of the Sign of the Tree. But um, then this woman was here, I think it must have been, maybe it was this time last year, a woman, from, a musician, a cellist. And um, she said, is this uh, the original? I said, yes. And she said, would you ever consider selling it? And for, for, without even, I had never thought about it. I said, yes, if you want this painting as a cellist, I would sell it to you. Mm -hmm. I had never thought about it in advance. It's just that at the time, mm -hmm. you, you're give, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and my God, it had probably been here 10 or 12 years. How large was it? They're all the same size. Uh, you did. Um, well, I tell you what, next time, next time I write to her, I'll ask her if, if she, just tell her if she wants to sell it, that someone in Albuquerque would, who knows, you know? She hasn't, she hasn't finished paying for it, so. <laughs> if she. <laughs> <laughs> a repossessed painting. <laughs> oh. But my paintings, uh, to tell you the truth, are considerably less than they might be because I never worked through galleries. I don't feel I have to give 50, I don't have to jump my prices up 50% in order to, for a gallery owner to pay his rent. I don't play those games. So um, it's, I, 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 I feel okay about, you know, selling paintings now. The golden mind. Well, now talk to me. Do you have some questions or impressions or favorite images? What are the images that, that most uh, remain sort of, you know, hanging in your imagination? Oh, Hildegard, okay. Yeah. Everyone's now saying, won't you do me a Hildegard? I want a Hildegard. <laughs> they, kind of, they kind of flew out of the studio. I don't think I had them two weeks. Yeah. Um, but I do love them, and they're very, they are, they're very, and everybody these days knows something about Hildegard. And maybe, maybe she'll come back, I don't know. I would like for her to come back. Um, all these little visitations. And I get to stay with, this is how I get to stay with these people, these visitations. I get to paint them for weeks at a time. And then I get to look at them and I get to think, you know, just get to say, oh, thank you. And then they leave and go wherever they're going. <laughs>
I think um, what I'd like to first talk about is kind of what happened to get me here to uh, Mind Rats Retreat, and it all kind of all fits together. Um, I have a woman that I work with in Mill Valley that um, Mind Red likes to call my spiritual counselor, and um, she is actually one of the people who is writing uh, one of the essays for Mind Red's book. And um, as she was writing the, uh, the essay for um, the book, she asked if she could use one of the dreams that I had shared with her um, a couple years ago. And so, of course, I said yeah, I would. And um, that dream had to do with, um, well, actually it had to do with a long period of time where I had really been kind of searching and not finding anything that I was looking for as far as spirituality. And um, I had always hoped that one day I'd have some kind of dream that would uh, lead me or talk something about the goddess or the great mother. And um, I had one dream that that was the case. And um, I was um, at a church, actually it was a large church up on a hill, and this beautiful woman came up to me and uh, she was just beautiful even though she looked young. They told me she was the grandmother of the bride and at this church a wedding was going to occur very shortly. And so uh, the woman um, said that she had a question to ask me and would I come with her and so I walked with her up to the top of the hill where the church was and lost her. She disappeared and I never got to um, hear what question it was that she wanted to ask me. And the only sense I had from the dream that this definitely was a goddess uh, figure. And so I was always intrigued um, by what she was and what that could mean to me and what question she'd have for me. Um, so. Um, my counselor, Virginia, had said to me, I was going on my first trip to Italy, and out of the blue, she said, why don't you take that dream with you? And I thought it was a little weird, but I thought, well, whatever, I'll take it with me. So I made a Xerox coffee, put it in my journal, and took it with me. And um, I took a day trip to Siena, and I was shocked to see, as we approached Siena on the tour bus, that the exact church from my dream was in Siena. Um, and there's two churches in Siena. One is the very famous, very large Duomo Cathedral. And it wasn't that, it was the older church, kind of nondescript one over on the hill. Um, because I was on a tour, I didn't get, that wasn't really part of the tour. And so I uh, wanted to get there as much as I could and uh, it took till the very end of the day for me to get into the church. And I thought there must be something for me here. There must be something for me here. Uh, and yet I'm walking around the church thinking, I don't know what's here for me because it just nothing was grabbing me until I went to one of the altars in the church and there was this beautiful picture of a Madonna and child and I knew that that was the woman from my dream. And um, it, I, it's hard to describe the emotion, but um, it, was, it was just beautiful. And um, unfortunately, I only had five minutes in the church, so I didn't really get to work out the rest of the part of what the question was. Um, the best part is that um, I turned 50 this year, and I'm going back to Siena, and I'm going to stay in a place right next to the church, which is called um, San Domenico, and uh, spend time there and see how, how that will be. So um, I was very fortunate um, to have the dream number one, and second, uh, to even be asked that um, uh, the dream could be used within the essay for Meinrad's book. And then it came uh, to Virginia as she was actually working on the essay that um, maybe it would be good for me to be at one of Meinrad's retreat. It's just something that she put out there and wasn't very receptive to that at first. Um, and then one day it again, just came to me that I really needed to be here and I would, uh, I'm not sure why, but I need to be here and I am, I'm here and I'm glad I'm, I came. The end. <laughs>